Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Eero Koivista. I'm uh, from Stockholm, Sweden, uh, a little country way up north in Europe where we have lots of snow right now, actually. Uh, it's not as windy as here, as everybody's been telling me the last, the last two nights here. Anyway, um, I would like to thank the Indiana Police Museum of Art for bringing all of us here. I think it's, thank you very much to them. I would uh, like to say I think it's a little bit tough to follow Michael De Lucchi <laughs> as a speaker, but I'll do my best. Anyway, um, I'm, a, I'm an architect and designer, which is not so unusual in Sweden, or Italy for that matter either. I do a lot of, uh, um, I, I would say my studio is doing about 70% buildings, 30% design right now. And uh, this is just one piece we did uh, about six, seven years ago. Uh, I'm not going to talk so much about my own work. I'm going to talk more about uh, the particular kind of uh, modernism, uh, like industrially manufactured modernism, a little bit. So, where do I point this? Yeah, <laughs> thanks. I'm going to talk about these things. I'm going to. T it's, it's a very brief period. It's 20 years. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm trying to keep the things within that time frame. I'm talking about. Um, rail network, uh, different approaches, the birth of modern modernism in Europe, Swedish modernity, which I think is a, a very special chapter, uh, the Italians, the Brits, the populists, the editors and the new Europeans. First of all, I mean, it, it, it's a time frame which is very, very small. It's, it's just a little bit in between here and there's so much stuff being made. So many things being designed. There's so many things being done. So it's, I mean, 20 years in 35 minutes, that's a little bit difficult, but I'll do my best. Okay, so I'm pushing it. Nothing is happening. What? Red button? Okay, thanks. <laughs> I'm a little bit nervous, okay? So, so first, I, first I think it's very, very interesting to talk about size. Europe is a very small place compared to the United States. I just put these maps on top of each other, which means that uh, uh, if the United States is a, is a very big multicultural place, there are different centers and, and nodes of things happening, Europe is really a lot of very small countries which themselves have very, very different cultural approaches. So you could really, when you move from Italy to France or from France to Sweden or Denmark, you could have a completely different cultural setup, which I think is really, really interesting when you work in this profession. And uh, we also have in Europe these days, I mean, it's all about communication. So we have a fast rail network. We have trains uh, going 320 kilometers an hour uh, all over all over um, Europe, so it means that you, you could basically uh, live in Paris and have a meeting in, uh, in London and be back almost before lunch, which is really, really quick. Uh, and I think that is also very, very important when you think about this profession, because it's really, really turning really global right now. I also think there are different approaches. <laughs> what, what I think is, is modernity maybe has a different, um, has a, has a diff, it's, it's a different thing in Europe than here, modernity. And uh, I think it's interesting to note that, oh, okay, so that when we develop cars, I mean the United States is, is the whole society is based upon cars. Uh, it's funny when you go to this museum this morning, you go 25 minutes on a motorway to, to get to the museum. And we also develop, uh, I think the way of developing modernity in, in Europe is, is very, very different. And I think when you go here and you look at the tables and chairs and ceramics and glass, you have to think about this completely different approach. Oh, yeah, well, 
Anyway, so, so the birth of, of modern modernism in Europe, I think, to me as a designer, my view, I'm, I'm telling you my view because I'm Swedish and I have, uh, I'm, I'm not sharing the same views. I like a lot of the things. I think the exhibition is really, really nice. But uh, I like all the things, but unfortunately I can only design uh, one kind of things myself. Sorry for that. I wish I was Mikhail de Lucchi, but it, I'm not. <laughs> and, uh, and to me, uh, what really started uh, industrial modernism was Dieter Rams in Germany. Uh, and I think, from my opinion, he was the first designer who managed to design a whole company through its products. And of course I'm talking about Brown and this less but better, which was his, uh, his mantra, what you could say. And I mean, this is a very old product, uh, a little radio, and I think it's very, very interesting to compare this with Apple today, Jonathan Ive. I, I think most of you have seen this picture. And I believe that the modern the typology of the modern object is, is really kind of moving in its own little universe. And it's, it's really, of course you have to categorize like you have to do in a museum or in this exhibition. But I really think this is, it's moving along its own little track, in its own little parallel universe. And you could clearly see it in things like the iPhone when you put it in a calculator mode and even the buttons are all the same. So Swedish modernity is, um, is something else, I think. Uh, Sweden is a small country. I live in Stockholm, which is about one-third up in, in Sweden. And it means that just to get out of the country, you have to be uh, on a plane for one hour even before you leave the country. Uh, I wish they put Stockholm where Malmo is, but, you know, they didn't. Uh, and we have loads and loads of nature. Well, you have it here too, but we really, uh, it's, it's really, Sweden is really like a little city. Forest, 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 city, forest, 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 city. It's a little bit like that. So, so we are very obsessed with nature in our way of, of looking at things, and most Swedes have this relationship with it. I mean, living in Stockholm, which is the capital of Sweden, uh, you could be in nature in 10 minutes, which is really, really, really quick. And we have this, uh, and also a design tradition from, from my part of the world. We used to be very, very poor part. Um, like 200 years ago. And even when we imported, you know, we imported our kings, they, we imported the kings from France. Very practical arrangement. And, and, uh, and it means that uh, we also took the style, uh, the French the style at that time, and made it, uh, we call it the Gustavian style. And to me, the Gustavian style is like a pared down, minimal, um, French Baroque, and I think it's much nicer than the original, actually. And you could still see this in Scandinavian design, and I think this is the kind of, the kind of spirit to it. It's really difficult to put in words. And uh, what I think is also very interesting is we don't really use the word modernism in Sweden. Uh, the whole modernist movement was called functionalism, uh, which I think is um, it's kind of interesting because Half a year in Sweden, it's a little bit like a cross between Indianapolis and Alaska. Half of a year is really, really cold, uh, which is really good for your working morals because you're in the studio and it's snowing outside and you're looking out and you think, well, maybe I'll do another hour and then it stops snowing and then I could go home. Uh, so we are obsessed with function, you know. We don't have too many Italian cars in Sweden because it's really crucial in the north of Sweden that your car starts when you go home, you know. Uh, so, so that's why we, have, at least for the moment, have Volvo and Saab. And, and because this movement was called, the whole, the whole modernist movement was called functionalism. So we are obsessed with function. And I really, of course there are many ways a thing, an object could function, but I really think that when a thing is, 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 uh, works very well, it functions well, it is beautiful, it kind of uh, connects with you emotionally, uh, it's, it's like making chairs which are not comfortable. To me it's, it's kind of stupid. 
Uh, I, and I also think that because we have this thing, so the language which we use in the things which are made from my part of the world, I think they have this kind of ongoing uh, kind of strictness but with a little bit of humor in it, which I like very, very much. I just saw yesterday when I was here at the opening that the things which um, uh, I was a part of in the design, I've been in the neo-pop uh, department now. <laughs> I never thought about myself as neo-pop, but maybe. <laughs> so this is just some, some typical Swedish industrial product. Uh, and, and for me personally, the people who, who came before for us uh, and, and to me were, for me were important Swedish designers, uh, I think is, is, is the work of Thomas Sandel, which is another uh, architect in Stockholm. And you can see in the objects, they have this certain kind of restrained thing, but always with a little, little twist, like the little socks on the chair and so on. And uh, maybe Thomas Eriksson, which I think, uh, at least at that time, around 1990, um, was, was a really, really important designer in Sweden. And uh, he moved on, started getting a bigger office, and uh, he made uh, the whole uh, uh, graphics for Scandinavian Airlines, which I still think is maybe the best uh, designed airline ever, and I think it's really important when you I travel a lot, uh, and I think it's really, really interesting to see how different airlines in the world kind of took this way of simplifying the, the graphics of an airline. Um, so, I'm going to talk about um, the Italians a little bit. Around 1985-90, when I was studying to be a designer or an architect, um, almost the only high design in the world, I mean really high, what I mean with high design, was Italian. And uh, it was the thing which everybody looked at and everybody kind of uh, followed. And uh, I think it's, it's really, really important to think that during these 20 years, that has changed a lot. And, and people like Achille Castaglione, which to me is maybe the best designer who ever lived, um, actually, one year in, uh, when I was a, a student, I saw him at the Salone in Milan, and uh, he was like 10 meters away, and I couldn't, I was so nervous, I couldn't go and say hello to him, because I thought he was like God. And, and then I spent the whole next year worrying that he would die, and, and I couldn't go and say hello to him. <laughs> so. So, a year after I met him at an opening again in Milan, I was like, oh, nice to meet you, and you know, you're a hero for me. And he was just smoking and looking at me and talking Italian, looking at all the girls around. <laughs> and these are just the lamps. I think he was 93 or something. Well, anywhere. So, when you look at modernity and industrial modernity, uh, to me, uh, uh, the most, maybe the two most important designers right now, uh, or, or kind of who shaped this in the last about 20 years, is of course Antonio Chiterio, and this is his cutlery for a, a Finnish brand Itala, and, uh, and and the second one is Pierre Lissoni, uh, which to me today almost has shaped uh, the way you look at Italian uh, modernity in design, and uh, with this. Everything uh, he designed is so elegant. It's really like super, like almost turbo elegant. I don't, I don't know what, so, I, don't, I can't find even find the word. I think it's really, really interesting. It's very, very low key. And I think it's also interesting uh, when you are a designer. Uh, I mean, one of the things you think about all the time is typologies. Uh, and I think he created more or less together with Chiterio. The, the image of, of modern Italian elegance. And what is interesting also, which is a, a big part of Ita Italian design industry, is, is of course the craftsmanship, which Michael De Lucchi talked about earlier, but it's also uh, the thing that most design companies in Italy are art directed. They have an art director who works with it. And I think uh, Lissoni's work with uh, Buffy, uh, which this picture is from, and, uh, and uh, Living Divani has kind of also shaped that. And you could look at almost all the Italian companies, there's always somebody, they always have an art director on board who kind of uh, helps to kind of 
move or how to say put out the direction of which the company should move. Um, I think this is something which uh, was not uh, apparent in the other other European countries at the time, and uh, which is also maybe one of the reasons why Italian design was so strong. Also, I think the fact that most Italian designers at that time were architects uh, and not uh, uh, like purely product designers. And I think, especially when you talk about furniture, I think, but this is my personal opinion, I think one of the big mistakes of uh, architects of the world was to give away furniture to the product designers. Because I think we have furniture today which looks like smart cars or toothbrushes. <laughs> and I think, um, I think furniture always exists in a context, uh, which is uh, uh, not the thing with cars. It's funny when you see old pictures of Corbusier houses with uh, cars from the same era outside. It looks really like a veteran cars collection or something. So, to me, one of the big uh, important changes, uh, and especially being Scandinavian, was when the Brits arrived on the design scene. And as many times before, um, I mean, it's the same as with pop music. I think they made a lot of big changes to it. Uh, the interesting fact is that it was the Italians who, who brought in the British to, to Italy to design, which I also think is one of the big things uh, which is kind of unusual, um, or was at that time, around 1990, that, um, that in one country they brought in so many foreigners. And today, if you look in an Italian design company, they work with people from Japan or from from other parts of Asia, Australia, of course, all over Europe. The Americans work a lot of Italian companies. This didn't used to be the case before. So to me, there were five British uh, designers, which for me kind of really uh, shaped uh, industrial modernity as, as the way we see it today. And the first and most important is, of, at least for me, was Jasper Morrison, which, uh, uh, when I first saw the things, I thought, oh, they are so Swedish. His, his things are so Swedish. Of course, he was more influenced by, I think, he was more influenced by Dieter Rams when he started. But um, it really, there's, there was, when these things came, and this was just after Memphis, uh, to me, it was kind of a revelation. I was a young designer at that time, and I thought that, wow. And I really, they were, at that moment, we didn't have Japanese design the way we have it today. And we really like something, some really like it. It was a very, very strong thing for me to see. And Jasper Morrison has, has really uh, repeatedly been able to, to renew the modernist typology in, in different ways. Um, same thing with this chair, this is the low pad chair for Cappellini. It was a it was really, when you saw it, it felt like a completely new page in, in industrial modernism. I still think, and I also think what is interesting with a lot of these objects from this particular field. Yeah, I would like to say also that the reason I'm talking about it is that I was asked to talk about it, uh, is, is that still uh, 15 years down the line, I don't think these objects have aged at all, or very, very little, which really can't be said about our movements in design. Um, this chair, same thing um, for, for Magis, also Jasper's work. Also one of these things when you saw, it felt, abs I think, of course chairs are really, really difficult. There are certain ty typologies in furniture which are difficult. And, and uh, the reason it is difficult is that if, if you just move the seat up or down one centimeter, you feel it in your body. The chair is, is the, the single piece of design uh, which I think uh, kind of, uh, your, your whole body is, is, is so, uh, have so many ideas how it should feel or how it should be. Uh, and I also think it's really, really interesting to just compare American chair design with uh, European chair design. It's a, it's a really, really big difference. Uh, and uh, of course, I, my, 
My girlfriend dropped my toaster into the floor about um, two weeks ago. And uh, so we had to get a new toaster at home. So we immediately said, let's go and buy the Jasper Morrison toaster because that's really the nicest toaster on the market. It's this one. And uh, we couldn't find it. They ceased production of it in Europe because it's, it doesn't work. <laughs> so again, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting that, that if the functionality isn't there, you know, and I, I mean, this is a coffee machine, same series for Raventa. Uh, it's, it's incredible the prices you have to pay for these on eBay right now. And I think he even put on his website, if you go on Jasper Morrison's website, it says that, don't buy these products. <laughs> I think I would have removed them from the website. Anyway. And another one for that, at that time, the, the second one of the British ones was James Irvin. Who's, who to me, his language was very, very, very um, influenced by, the, by Sotsas, because he used to work for Sotsas, and you can see it in his forms. And I think at that time, he was also, he, he came and he teached in Sweden, and I think uh, you could see it on, on his language. The sofa is actually for a Swedish company. Uh, another one is uh, Tom Dixon, which I um, was completely self-taught. And I think maybe the most important uh, parts of his work is um, that he was um, art directing Habitat, and he's still doing it um, half time for a, for a very very long time. And uh, he managed to kind of Habitat for I think uh, if if you don't know it, it it was a British company uh, founded by Terence Condren in the 60s and uh, which uh, are working very much in the modernist ideal uh, in their products. They have shops all over Europe. Uh, the last one, oh, no, the second last one is Ross Lavgro, with his very fluid, uh, to me, very, uh, the same language as Luigi Culani, uh, in his objects, very, very fluid objects. I actually, uh, <laughs> He's quite a funny guy. I, I, I met him at the opening in, in London in September. And I came and, and, and I said, hi. And I said, hi, Ero, how are you doing? Well, I'm fine. And how are you? Well, I'm doing my, my organic shit, as always. <laughs> but he's, uh, I really like his stuff. He's great. And the last one, uh, and, and maybe one of the most important, I think, of all this, is, is Mark Newsom. And, uh, and his objects, which kind of have this very, very, very optimistic, uh, um, fluid shape in his, in his things. And uh, I mean, this thing, I remember when this Madonna video came and, and uh, it was a Lockheed Lounge, which he put, put together himself. Um, I think it's, uh, I believe it's one of the most expensive pieces of contemporary furniture. There's actually one in the exhibition. So if, you, if nothing else, go and see the exhibition because it's probably the only time you're going to see one of them for real. Uh, and, and to me, maybe his best project ever was the car he made. And I also think this is really, really interesting. He made it for Ford and uh, it, it was just a project, a prototype for something which never happened. And this was at the time, even, even almost before all the European car manufacturers started making small cars again. This was before the Mini and so on. And I, I still think it's an absolutely great project. Maybe his best ever. And then we have the populists, uh, which I'm not going to talk so much about. But at the same time, we had a whole range of things which uh, um, um, got a lot of media attention and, uh, and looked really weird. Uh, and didn't work at all. <laughs> and, um, and they created the design star, which I, which I don't really like at all, I must say. I think it's a, a, a really bad path in design that we have design stars. Um, so I'm not going to talk about that anymore. <laughs> uh, and another really, really important, important the last important thing I'm going to talk about today is, is the editors. Because if you are a designer, uh, I, I wish I could start a Produzione Privata, as, as 
Mikkel has. But I have to work with companies. And if you work with a good company, uh, it's almost like, how should I say in the right way, they do half the design. Because if you work with somebody in a good relationship, you can create really, really nice things. And this has been incredibly important for European design. Of course, you have Herman Miller and you have Noll here in the States, but uh, I don't really know right now if it's anything except maybe Apple, but, but uh, which is really, really, really great. And of course, you have Alessi, who, who, who always in tableware, one of the big Italian companies. Another one is uh, Capellini, which I, I think Giulio Capellini to me is uh, maybe um, the most important Italian manufacturer of them all. He's, um, he's really, really good. I managed to sneak in some of our own products there, by the way. Uh, Vitra, of course. Uh, I know I saw that Rolf Fellbaum is here. It's is an incredible company, fantastic company. Uh, for everybody who's in, interested in design, I think it's amazing how, how they managed to put design in every part of the company, from the factory, the architecture of the factory, uh, the, the, the brochures, the, the communication. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's really uh, amazing. And from my part of the world, I think Itala from Finland is, is uh, another company. I mean, one of the mantras of the company is, is uh, that uh, everything should really work. Um, here are things by Alfredo Herbeli, Chiterio, and, and, um, and the cookingware is, is, is actually one of our stuff. And uh, when we got that assignment to do cookingware, which was about five years ago, they said, we want you to design the best piece of cookingware ever. And, um, and it should function much better than anything else. So we spent three years with them. We had like 10 professional cooks using it for six months just to, and then we corrected some things. And I still think that that, that, that uh, pot there is, is the best thing. It's, it's maybe the only thing I ever designed which is 100% perfect. <laughs> and I'm not joking. It's, uh, we improved uh, uh, the way it works on, on, in I think at least 10 different things. I won't talk about that now, but you should try it. Uh, the, the sad thing is that it doesn't sell too well because uh, people think it looks weird. So I'm talking really, really shortly about the new Europeans. And we have a new generation since uh, around the turn of the century who's doing really, really interesting things. We have uh, the French brothers Ronan and Ervan Borolek who managed to, to kind of move modernism in a fur, further on in a really, really weird way. I, I, they continue to surprise me to this day. We have Great Chick, which is maybe the best uh, designer alive uh, right now, I think. He is uh, uh, always trying to do, to do something really, really well. We have a uh, last of these ones. We have Hella Jongerius, which I think is interesting in this um, together with these others, because I think she's the first uh, designer who's really, really successfully has transformed really handicraft things into industry in a completely new, new direction, where uh, it's really difficult to say what she, what she will do next. Really, really interesting. And of course, we are here, 2005, and that was four years ago. And I think so much has happened since in these four years. Uh, I think that today it's really, really difficult to even talk about European design anymore because there are so many. I mean, this is just, just, just a few which are doing work in the modernist uh, kind of path. And, and today I think uh, Japanese, uh, I go to Japan quite often because I work there in different projects. And every time I, I see something new which I haven't seen and the way of, of making it, uh, renewing, European design is, is really, really amazing. So I think that design has really starting to be global right now. And it's, of course, it has to do with the internet and things like that. But I, I don't really believe so much in, 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 uh, in, in design 
2009 in design from a certain part of the world anymore. We also have design companies, which small, young design companies, which has popped up all over the world in the, in the last two, three, four years, uh, which are doing really, really good things. And maybe for me personally, I would say that the most important thing in design today, it would be great uh, if you could make something which could extend the lifetime of products that I think is to me the biggest challenge. Thank you.